Yeah, I think that's probably uh, good enough to get us started. So today's presentation is by Dr. Kelly about camera traps. So there have been a lot of discussion previously in the seminar about how can we use technology to help with uh, biodiversity. And so I think this is a really nice example. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing this talk and then having a discussion maybe how um, engineering, deep learning, things like that might be able to help this endeavor. So Marcella, can you, if you go ahead, the screen is yours. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? We do. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot for having me um, come and talk to this group. Um, and so what I will do is talk a little bit about um, uh, my experience with camera traps and, and uh, how I use the data. And then I'll end with sort of what are some of the issues and the challenges that we have with this type of data, which is growing um, day by day, just more and more quantity of data that's difficult to deal with. Um, okay, so um, first a little bit of background on camera trappings. They, camera traps were basically, um, uh, they've been around since the 1980s, or sorry, 1890s, long time ago, but those were um, using basically trip wires and track pads and things like that. And it wasn't really until the 1980s when um, deer hunters out there started using them for scout scouting hunting grounds and things like that. And then in the 90s really is when us biologists started to jump on um, these remotely triggered cameras and use them um, um, for biological purposes. Um, and then cameras only started to become digital in the mid 2000s mid to late 2000s. So it's really relatively new technology out there. Um, and applications today, most studies that uh, use remotely triggered cameras, the majority of them are on mammals, um, especially terrestrial mammals, which is what I work on. Um, just because they work really well, especially for animals like large carnivores that use uh, trails or roads or some, somewhere where you can easily place a camera and um, and get an animal to walk in front of it and then have it be triggered. Um, there are some studies on birds and there are some studies on herps, but since most of these cameras are triggered by heat, uh, heat and motion, um, they tend to work better on, on mammals. Um, some people still use them just for plain old remote wildlife photography. National Geographic does a lot of work with remote cameras, but for the purpose more of getting um, pretty pictures, whereas we use them uh, more for talking about something about animal populations. And lots of recreational users are still out there um, using cameras for the scouting out hunting grounds, et cetera. So this is just an example of some original film cameras that have now gone to digital and all of them sort of work the same way. They all have these passive infrared sensors. So anything that passes in front of that sensor uh, is gonna get its photograph taken. Um, and so right now you still have to do a fair amount of going out and checking your cameras and making sure they're all working and the batteries are changed and all that. But we are all waiting for the day when eventually we'll get these um, cameras that can remotely download to a base station or to a satellite and sort of uh, upload. Um, and there are some of those cameras available, but um, they're not really available in uh, in a way that you can use them with when you have hundreds of cameras out on a landscape, which is the kind of work that I'm used to doing. Um, and I certainly don't want images being downloaded to my phone, which is what a lot of them do um, now. So, so there's a lot of uh, possibility for improvement in the actual cameras themselves. Um, and I don't really deal with that aspect at all. Uh, but I would be, I would love it if they would be able to be downloaded remotely somehow so that we didn't have to physically go out there every two weeks and change um, memory cards and things like that. Um, this is just a picture of how we set up these remote cameras for animals and um, it really depends on your purpose and what you're trying to do in your study. Um, I tend to use the upper left where I have two cameras, one on either side of a trail or road, and I try to photograph both sides of an animal because I'm looking for distinct spot patterns so that I can tell individuals apart. But you might not always need that. Sometimes people are interested in looking, like say in the middle at just whether or not animals are using an underpass or an overpass. Um, uh, in the example in the upper right, uh, these wolverines have distinct marks on their necks, so they need to get neck photographs, so they have a slightly different way that they um, position their cameras to get photographs of the necks of these animals. 
Uh, this is an example, this photograph here of um, how we set up remote cameras. And this one is from Mountain Lake Biological Station about half an hour away from here. Um, and we run a survey, we run a survey each year up there. And um, again, two cameras per station, and then we clear vegetation to get uh, clear images of the animals. Okay, so what I'll switch into now are the types of uses and, and sort of um, what the cameras are used for now for wildlife management purposes and wildlife um, population studies. I won't spend a lot of time on the first two, and I'll spend more time on, on three and four uh, where we use um, where the strength in remote cameras really lies in presence, absence, or occupancy and population estimation. But there are some increasing uses for behavior and activity rates, and I'll show you some of those here. This is an example from Virginia Tech of behavioral research um, done on black bears. And before remote cameras existed, we didn't know that black bears didn't completely hibernate all winter long, that they actually come in and out of their dens, and they even come in and out of their dens with their um, little bear cubs. And so we got an idea of emergence times and how frequently they come in and out of hibernation and that, and just new information about these animals. This next example just shows you what we can do because the cameras have date and time stamps, we can figure out when are they most active. So in this case, we're comparing jaguar and puma activities or uh, puma also known as mountain lion. and. Um, and you can see that they're actually very similar. Maybe the uh, puma, which is the light gray bars, are a little bit more active in the morning, but both of them are not very active in the middle of the day, and then they pick up in the evenings and uh, very early mornings. Um, so just information on timing of activity for animals. This next example is very specific. We have got an example of nest predation, one by foxes and another one by crocodiles on eggs. Um, and then there's a link that I've included there on that I'm not going to click on right now, but it's, it's in the PowerPoint of um, a really neat use of um, video camera data for underpasses to see if animals are using, um, using those underpasses. Uh, another study out of Virginia Tech that we're currently doing right now is examining scavenging behavior. So setting up remote cameras on uh, roadkill deer carcasses to examine what is the level of scavenging across the landscape out there for black bears, uh, bobcats, and coyotes. And is there any sort of dominance hierarchy? Um, and in this case, we've got a bobcat and a coyote facing off over a carcass. Uh, in the next, we've got a golden eagle, and then we've got a coyote and a skunk, and then a bobcat and a raccoon. So we're learning new things about uh, how much scavenging goes, out, goes on on the landscape and um, who does it and when. So the second um, aspect that I won't spend too much time on is just looking at um, not only like timing of activity, but where are animals most active. Um, so just this is more like a trapping rate. So number of photographs that you get over, over a certain amount of time, however many nights you have your cameras out. Um, and you can, you can summarize this type of data uh, by looking at things like here, this is from Mountain Lake as well. Um, and it appears, as you would expect, in this part of the world, we, have a, we get a lot of photographs of white-tailed deer, so that's the largest bar there over on the left. Um, and then squirrels, raccoons, things like that. And so this is one type of way that we can summarize our data. Um, however, these trapping rates are a little bit, um, um, they're an index of abundance, so we're really wary not to call them a actual abundance of animals. And the main reason is because you can get one individual, like in this example here, we've got um, a jaguar from one of my long-term study sites where um, we thought we had a lot of photographs of jaguars. We had 109 pictures of, of sorry, we had, we had um, yeah, we had 109 photographs in this year in 2005 um, of this particular animal, but 75 of those 109 were of the same individual who was just being really, really trap happy and being photographed um, across the study site at almost every single camera station, sometimes two and three sites a night. And so, so it makes it really uh, problematic sometimes to use an index of abundance where you use a trapping rate. But um, with that warning, I'll move on into the next realm of what we use the data for. So the strength again um, in camera trapping is that we can um, use this data for presence or absence on which we're now calling detection, non-detection data, and this whole world of occupancy modeling. And so occupancy is essentially just 
you know, what sites are occupied across your landscape. Um, but the term has really come to mean the type of analysis where you correct for the fact that you don't have 100% detection. So you correct for this imperfect detection, and it's better than just saying how many sites do you have these animals at. Now we, we know uh, occupancy, once corrected for imperfect detection, we can say uh, what is that distribution of animals across the landscape. Oops, sorry about that little typo in that slide there. Um, okay, so. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples now. Um, this example is from some work we did um, in Madagascar that is still ongoing, but some publications that, we, that came out um, in 2015 uh, from our long-term surveys in Madagascar across multiple different sites, which are, are depicted up in the upper right. Um, and um, in, th in this case, we ran surveys for five years and in the next slide, and then we estimated occupancy across those different years to see how these animals were faring across the landscape. And then this slide is showing you all these different animals which are, are very unique and unusual. And on the y-axis, you can see prob probability of occupancy which goes from zero to one or zero to 100%. Um, and so for this first animal, which is known as a fusa, it's set, sitting at about 100, uh, sorry, at about 80% occupancy or 80% of that study site, the animal is being photographed um, across 80% of that study site. So it's really widespread across that study site. And the same goes for the next animal uh, called Fusa Fusana, which is the Malagasy civet. Over time, it has declined a little bit from nearly 100% occupancy to uh, down to about 80, but we're not too worried about it. But the power of this technique has really shown us that the other species in this landscape, these um, little mongoose type species, um, are not doing very well. So all of them, Eupleris, went from 80% occupancy down to 20. Galidia went from about 50 down to almost zero. Um, same with the broad stripe mongoose, um, Galadictus, from 80% down to 20%. And then Salanoia also from nearly from 90% down to almost 10%. So what we're seeing is a dramatic decrease in distribution of these species across the landscape. And it's, it's indicative, I think, of population crashes. And what we saw at the same time during these studies was an increase in feral cat. So that's down, down in the lower right. Feral cat, as feral cats increased across this landscape, and they are similar in size to these species that are declining. Uh, we think that there's um, just competition going on out there and these feral cats are displacing these species across the landscape. The dogs didn't change very much. The Canis familiaris, those are dogs that usually are accompanied by people, so, uh, kind of hovering at 40 or 50% occupancy. So we're starting to get an idea of uh, this, this problematic introduced species um, and here's another example. This is also Madagascar in the same study. This is an introduced species um, from Africa, the African civet. And what, what the other type of thing you can do with this data is you can use habitat variables. In this case, we use distance to village. And what we're seeing is that when you're really, really close to the villages, this species does really, really well, has high occupancy at 50, uh, around 50%. So it actually does well around villages, but as you get farther and farther away from those villages and you go out into the forest, um, it does not do well. So it can't compete very well with species out in the forest, but it can compete and probably outcompete these native species the closer and closer you get to villages. So another thing we like to do with this type of data is can we see where carnivores, in my case, I'm very interested in carnivores um, and these top predators. And so we want to see, do they overlap? So we can use what we call these two species occupancy models where we estimate the species interaction factor, which is known as SIF. And basically, if that SIF is greater than one, these species are actually appear to be sort of attracted to each other or they at least occupy the same areas more frequently than uh, would be expected at random chance. Or if they're less than one, they don't co-occur together. So going back to that Madagascar example, when we looked at the dogs and this uh, brown mongoose, we, we see that in areas with no dogs, those black dots right there, that this, um, this brown mongoose occupancy is pretty high. 
uh, ranging from 30 up to 80% when there's no dogs. But when there are dogs uh, in this landscape, the, the, um, the brown mongoose doesn't do very well. So very low, low occupancy. Um, and again, this total patches is just an, a, an indication of fragmentation. So the more and more fragmented the habitat um, gets, actually the, the, these animals' um, occupancy goes up a little bit. So they don't really have anywhere else to go. So they're in these small patches of habitat. Um, if we look at that species interaction factor, again, this is the one where if it's below one, there is no co-occurrence. So there is an avoidance um, interaction between these two species. So the, this is the kind of thing that we can do with these remote camera data that is really powerful. We can st start looking at these, these animals now and looking at interactions. Granted, we don't know physically if they're actually interacting, but we're seeing something across the landscape in terms of where they're occurring um, in space. Uh, we have ratcheted this up to, to include the Madagascar study and eight other, sorry, 13 other studies across the world. So using camera trap data um, from my lab, that those studies are highlighted in red. So all those studies um, that I highlighted in red are, are from Virginia Tech. Um, and then I have a few other colleagues that um, contributed their data. And then the remaining studies, we um, just contacted people on the internet and they provided their data to us to actually look at um, uh, remote camera data sort of on a worldwide scale and try to examine these species interactions between these top predators um, across study sites and see if we could find any trends. So looking at this crazy graphic right here, I'll explain it briefly. Um, these are all, each panel is a different country. And um, what you're seeing is these species interaction factors. Again, the, um, the um, red line indicates one, which is independent occurrence. And the blue line indicates sort of the mean across these countries. And the interesting thing we found was when we did this on this, across these countries, um, we really found that co-occurrence was more common. So the blue line was often on top of the red line. So the average was usually greater than one. Um, probably indicating that the habitat quality might be a more important and that these animals are attracted to similar features of the habitat rather than uh, having antagonistic e interactions with each other that cause them to have a species interaction factor less than one. So we're finding out some interesting things and I won't go into any more detail, but we have done a lot of habitat modeling with these, um, with this same data set to show what features of the habitat the animals are, are uh, queuing in on. We would like to, to uh, crack the space and time continuum if possible, trying to, to look at spatial interactions, but also what about the timing of activity? So right now when we look at space, we often just are just saying, was the animal captured at that particular camera station at any time in those two months? Whereas um, we would like to be able to say, well, what about time of day? Maybe they're avoiding each other on a much finer time scale. So we are trying to do some cool 3D modeling of, um, of, in this case, our three axes, our time of day on the sort of um, x-axis, and then this, this uh, y-axis is our uh, species, our temporal, um, spatial temporal value, which is just multiplying a, a species interaction factor times the time of day that they're active and overlapping with each other. I'm not gonna spend much time explaining that. Uh, and then this sort of z-axis here is that fragmentation. So as you go from zero to a thousand, you become more and more fragmented. And the high peak here is um, occurring at between eight and 10 in the morning in super fragmented sites. And this is when local people bring their dogs into the forest. And so this is dogs and that brown mongoose that we're worried about that seems to be not doing very well. Um, and it does seem like they're this potential for space and time interactions is early in the morning when hunters are bringing or gatherers when they go in to gather what they need from the forest are bringing their dogs with them and so we're trying to convince people to please leave their dogs at home they don't necessarily need them when they uh, go out into the forest because that is a time period when they can really interact uh, dramatically with this brown mongoose and potentially kill them okay so um that was a little bit on occupancy model, a whirlwind tour of what we're trying to do in my lab. Um, I also focus a lot on abundance and density estimation for um, uh, lots of different um, projects. 
Uh, I have a long-term project on jaguars um, and uh, other cats that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and so you can do this individual identification not just on cats, but you can also do it on, we had a study that we, where we did it on deer and we just focused on the male portion of the population because you can tell the individuals apart by their antlers. Um, we've also had studies at Virginia Tech where um, people put streamers on bear's ears in order to tell them apart. So caught a lot of bears, put a bunch of streamers, then used remote cameras to tell them apart by their ear streamers. Uh, but it sure is a lot easier if the animals have natural marks. And so the people who um, really uh, published the seminal paper on this technique was um, Carantha Nichols, and that was in the late 90s when the first paper started coming out on estimating tiger population size using remote cameras and identifying the individuals by their, by their stripe patterns. So we copy that on jaguars, and in this case, I'm gonna give you our example where we copy that on ocelots. And so this example is from Belize in Central America where I have a long-term camera trapping project, and you can see in the lower right, the camera traps spread across multiple different study sites, and we actually have even more than uh, is depicted in this graphic. Um, and I'm gonna focus here on the ocelots because we had really good sample sizes for ocelots. We got a lot of different individuals and we were able to estimate uh, population density. So we focused on density rather than abundance because um, the study sites were different sizes. So of course, the larger your study site, the more animals you're gonna get. So we wanted to uh, standardize this. So we, we divided by area surveyed. So we've got um, density estimates. And mainly the thing to focus on are the black dots because that's the overall population the green and orange are just males versus females. Um, and so the black dots are uh, what they're showing you here is that um, in this first study site at the top, we have nearly 10 ocelots per 100 square kilometers, which is about 40 square miles. And it's really remarkably unchanged over this 10, 12 year time period. Um, in this next study site, the Mountain Pine Ridge, we have much, much lower densities. There's only between two and three with potentially a small decline, but, but perhaps not. I think we've just gotten more and more years of data. Uh, so our, our, um, our error bars are getting smaller. And so we're, that study site just does not have a lot of animals. It's pine forest, so that could be why. Uh, in this next site, study site called La Milpa, we, we're pushing up to 15 animals per square kilometer. Um, and then the, the, low, the two in the, um, at the bottom, are roughly sitting at between, uh, uh, roughly around 10 animals per square kilometer. So we're seeing differences among study sites and we're not seeing dramatic declines. So we're actually able to say something much more powerful when you can identify individuals. And that is we, we know how many anim animals are in that study site and that they don't seem to be declining. So from a, from a conservation perspective, this is really good news for, for ocelots. We are right Right now in the process of doing these, the same analysis for jaguars. Uh, it's just harder on jaguars because our sample sizes are smaller. We can also look at survival. So that's, um, these are survival rates and across the x-axis is just different study sites. And the neat thing is that survival rates are hovering at around 80%. So this is yearly survival. So across those study sites, um, survival rates are about 80%. Um, and population growth rates um, down here uh, are depicted with uh, lambda at 1.0, which means just a stable population, not increasing or decreasing. And the only one that looks like it's below that line is the MPR in the, in the, over in the right, and that is that pine forest habitat where the cats don't seem to do very well. But all the rest of them are overlapping, uh, whether you look at the total population or males versus females, they're all overlapping one. So we're not seeing any drastic declines in um, population size for these species. You can also plot dense across the landscape. Um, and this is a pretty neat analysis where that it shows you across the study site, hot spots in darker blue and black of where these animals are, are, have, uh, are concentrating their, um, where they occur at higher densities across our landscape and how that changes through time. And so that's, this is just a nice visual to depict that. Um, okay. Uh, last little thing before I switch to our problems that we're trying to solve is just we can also do multiple densities for uh, for a bunch of species simultaneously. In this example, we spaced our cameras at different type uh, different spacings 
zero to 250 meters apart versus 1.5 to 1.75 kilometers apart because the species are different sizes and have different movement parameters. So, um, so we are attempting to estimate density for multiple carnivores at the same time. And we were able to do it for seven different species. And Mopani and non-Mopani just means two different ha habitats. And generally the Mopani is really dense, thick forest and the non-Mopani is, is open habitat. And so we can see that spotted hyenas have similar densities across the different habitat types. Uh, but civets seem to do better in the non-Mopani habitat type. Uh, wild dogs are very low density um, and again do a little bit better in the non-Mopani habitat, although error bars overlap. Uh, Ard wolves, we didn't get any in the non-Mopani, so they do much better in that Mopani thick forest habitat. Uh, and lions are pretty similar across the habitat types. So, um, so yeah, so this is just showing you um, that certain species just do better in that more open habitat and other species do better um, in the closed habitat. But in general, more species do better in that open habitat. Okay, so this, this whole world of abundance and density estimation is rapidly expanding. So I tend to sit uh, in this world trying to keep up with and develop new techniques for estimating density. Um, and my lab is working on a lot of different techniques. And so what we can't work on are these other issues that I thought might be interesting for you guys to know about. And so, so um, skipping to the challenges of camera trap data management, um, how do we do it? This is the part where um, we are struggling to try to keep up with the um, amount of data that we are generating um, and, and trying to just to get it into a usable form. And so this part is really, really challenging for us. Um, we encourage anybody who's using a camera trap study to enter all the data on all the species, including the human use, because that turns out to be extremely uh, important. Um, and that people need to plan a lot of time for actually entering the data, because it usually takes longer to get the dent data into some usable format than it does to actually collect the data. And we usually run our surveys for two to three months. So it often takes six months to get that data entered. Um, uh, and also then formatting it after the data has been entered for various types of analyses can be quite challenging as well. So I'll just walk you through the three ways that we are doing this and the th and possibilities for improvements. The first, I'm uh, sad to say, we are still stuck, at least in my lab, in doing a lot of manual data entry using kind of spreadsheets and Excel or Access. Um, partly that's because we have access to a lot of undergraduates and not exactly free labor because they do get experience and they do get independent study credit. So that has helped us um, a lot. And with the help of a lab manager, we usually have up to 10 to 15 students each semester helping us enter data and then error checking them, uh, error checking each other and all of this stuff. Um, there are a couple of other different ways to do it. Some people use number two, the citizen science platforms that already exist. And then number three is the one that's on the rise right now, which I hope we are able to use in the future. And that is uh, artificial intelligence um, to analyze, to get all this data into a usable form. So the manual data entry, this is just what it looks like in my lab in that bottom um, left photograph. We have about five workstations like this that have, because I have two cameras per station, in that picture we have the camera that's on the left, on the left screen, the camera that's on the right, on the right screen, and then the students are entering data into a spreadsheet. Um, or they can use a laptop with the two camera stations um, depicted and enter the data into a spreadsheet uh, that way. Um, and then here's just a photograph of us documenting which camera station um, each, um, with a trigger card where, where each camera station was out on the landscape. Uh, as you can imagine, this is extremely tedious and requires lots of double checking um, by other by a second person. Um, okay, so that's this is the spreadsheet. I, we don't need to look at this. We have drop down menus where students can choose the the common name, scientific name, um, and, and all that stuff. And then they need to enter date and time and image and cameras and any kind of notes and human type and thing like things like that. So as you can tell. Um, a bit tedious um, for students. 
In addition to that, we also have other students who are identifying individual animals by their spot patterns and or stripe patterns and keeping a record of what we call their capture histories over time. So again, another tedious uh, process. Um, okay, so to switch to the second type of ways that people are getting this data entered, um, citizen science. So eMAML is one, is one example that's now run by the Smithsonian Institute. And what eMAML does is you upload your photographs to, um, to eMAML and then the public can just comment using their query tool. They can say, yes, that's a raccoon. Um, and then that has to be identified three times by three separate people as a raccoon before it gets tagged as, yes, that's a raccoon. And it, and it is labeled um, by, um, um, by the software as raccoon. And, and then at the end of your project, um, uh, eMAML will send you the results. Okay, so that can also still be fairly time consuming. Uh, here's an example of their interface. And if, you, if anyone wants to try it out, it's pretty fun. You can click on that eMAML light down there in the bottom, um, that green link that I have, and you can see the projects that are up, uploaded and you can see that you can click on them very easily and say, that's a coyote um, and move on to the next photo. So it's, it can be kind of fun and kind of addicting, but um, there has been some issues with public uh, getting bored with this type of interface. And the thing that worries a lot of people is this first sentence in the eMAML um, documentation, and that is that basically you give up the rights to that, um, to um, Smithsonian, to be able to use that to reproduce, publish, and distribute um, all of that data. This makes some people uncomfortable. It makes things like some of my funders um, uncomfortable. They, they do not agree with this. And so I, in some cases, I would not even be able to do this even if I wanted to because my funders won't allow, um, especially if there are endangered or threatened species, they don't want to um, post where these animals are photographed because they are GPS uh, linked and uh, at some point that becomes available to the public. There's another one called Zooniverse that is out there and Zooniverse is very, very similar. It started, I think, before eMAML um, and it started actually, uh, uh, it's called Zooniverse because it started with um, researchers that were interested in images of galaxies and they had the general public going in and trying to find galaxies for them. Now you can do the same thing, upload a project and people can tag it much the same way as eMAML um, and put what they think that species is. And I forget what their algorithm is, how many people need to agree that it's a raccoon before it goes in as being a raccoon, but, that, but it's very similar to eMAML. Um, and then this is their logo and, the, and there's a link to it there if anyone is interested in checking out eMAML and looking at the projects. Um, but again, this can also take some time before you wait for your results to come back. Um, and then there's the third style. So besides just brute force and Excel spreadsheets or um, citizen science, then there is the this sort of new wave of uh, artificial intelligence. And Wildlife Insights is one of those programs that is out there that is a cloud-based artificial intelligence enabled platform in the Google Cloud. And um, it is primarily for species identification. So, um, so basically, um, and this is the paper, I've included the paper from, um, uh, from Wildlife Insights. Uh, how they do their classification and how that artif artificial intelligence um, works. Um, they do um, highlight that, uh, that um, they're very good at blank image filtering and they're very good at species classification. They train their AI models to recognize hundreds of species from around the world. Um, they use high quality training data sets for the AI and they have over 8.7 million images of different animals. So it, it may be that um, when you uh, use Wildlife Insights, um, they already have the species available that you are interested in, but it's also possible that they might not. And so they, they, they might need training um, photographs for them to make it work for your study. Again, same issues that some people have. The Wildlife Insights essentially says that they will share that with the public when that platform is released. Um, and then they have other disclaimers in here. I just left those in there in case anyone is interested. Um, but again, these types of things make it difficult for me because my funders will not allow uh, photographs necessarily to be um, shared with the general public. 
Um, and then here is a paper that came out that um, compared um, Wildlife Insights, the algorithms that Wildlife Insights use to the citizen science to see which one was more accurate and how, how did it work. And they actually used um, some data sets that were available in Zooniverse and then they ran them through their AI in Wildlife Insights. And um, they found that um, accuracy in identifying empty images was 91 to 98%. Accuracy of specific species was 89 to 93%. Um, and that the larger the data set was, the better the accuracy. And they felt that, um, or quantified that human effort was reduced by 43% compared to the citizen science um, type style of identifying images. Um, and again, this is just a picture from their paper. And if you're interested in that, you can look that paper up as well. Um, for me, I'm not as interested in um, developing these techniques. I'm just interested in using them. And so I would be very um, interested in collaborating with people who are interested in um, using an AI or, or, or building on one um, out there already. So one last um, little section I have for you is about individual identification. There are some free softwares out there and we just tested two of them in, in a VT study that's gonna be coming out. Uh, it's been accepted for publication and basically we compared Wild ID and Hotspotter um, for which one was better at identifying individuals. Our databases now are growing so large with 10 and 12 and 15 years of data that it's becoming more and more difficult to identify the individuals. And these animals live a long time, so some of them are still alive from our first year of study. So we're finding it hard to do this by, by human eye, which is what we were doing before. So now we've shifted to trying to do, do individual identification with, um, with the help of um, computer, computer algorithms. And so Wild ID has got one and Hotspotter's got another one. And we did this by ranking, we get image, images of variable quality. So as you can tell, there are a couple of low image qualities on the left, medium in the middle, and high quality uh, images on the right. And we did this for ocelots in the top row and jaguars in the bottom. And this is just a picture of Hotspotter that's um, trying to match um, spots um, on each of two different um, individuals there. And it's, and it's giving us a rank of which ones it thinks are the best the best potential matches. So our findings for this was uh, basically on the left for the Jaguar images, that um, they were very high, uh, very good at matching um, high quality images. So in the second uh, group of bars there where it says high quality, high quality photographs were matched at in the 90 percentile for uh, wild ID and not quite as high, uh, sorry, for Hotspotter. Hotspotter in general did better than wild ID across the board at all different image qualities. Um, but with high image qualities, we're, we're very accurate, over 90% of the images match. Uh, ocelots, they're a smaller species, was a little, little bit lower in matching uh, probabilities. They tend to be, the quality of the images tends to be um, not as good, they're not as large of an animal, so we often get um, poorer quality images for them. And in the next slide, I just want to make one point, and that is um, what we did find was that, interestingly, the images, if they were, for example, on the left, a low quality test image, it matched more often to a low quality image than it did to, say, a medium quality in that medium blue or a, a high quality in, in light blue. So, and the same went for the medium test images. They tended to match medium, matched better to medium images, and then high quality matched better to high quality images. So the take home message from this is that you should probably have multiple image qualities in your data set for each one of your individuals, because you don't know what you're gonna get in the field the next time you download your photos and you might have poor quality images, medium or, or um, high quality images. And so um, we found it really interesting that they tended to match to the images of the same quality, but I, I guess that makes sense. Okay, so last few slides. Wild Book is another program that has just come out that does both. Um, in the next slide, it does detection, so it identifies the species, and then it uses, I believe it uses a ver an, an algorithm very similar to Hotspotter to do individual ID. So this is, this is great. This would be really neat if we could do species identification and individual all at the same time. 
Um, but I have not played around much with Wildbook, and I think it's similar in that they sort of uh, have access to your data and they can use it um, uh, if they would like. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap that up so that we can have some discussion, but the main thing is that um, I'm hoping that AI uh, increases. I don't know how we're gonna be able to keep up with the sheer quantity of data that we have. Um, it's, and right now, and there are no students on campus, so we are getting no data entered. So, um, so that is a really a, a bummer for us. Um, we're gonna be uh, in trouble um, next year when um, we try to make up our reports, because I don't know how we're gonna get all of our data entered without our student workers right now. Um, we are making progress on individual ID, but I still think there's a lot of room for improvements. If your data set is really small, say you just went in and did one survey, there's a lot of pre-processing time. It might just be faster to do it by human eye. If your data set is too big, like what we're getting at now, the pre-processing time and computing takes a long time to get the, like you have to crop each one of the images and you have to enter it into the computer. Um, so the pre-processing time takes a bit of time. And the last issue that nobody has really tackled very well is what about um, those studies like mine where I have two cameras per station? I don't necessarily want to double count those animals, um, but I also wanna know if there are two different animals uh, in two different photographs. If, for example, a cub is walking behind a mother, I want, and, and we get a picture of the mother and then the next photo is of the cub. That might just go down as a jaguar, um, uh, but we might not, a human can tell that much better that one of those is a cub and one of those is an adult. So there are things like that that the human eye is still better at. And so I think there is room for improvement for, um, for all of these techniques that are out there. Okay, so that is um, all I have for you today. So I thought we'd just open it up for discussion.